And so we're gonna, we're gonna pick up on some of these things. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter five. And last week, if you were here and if you weren't here, I talked about, I talked about righteousness. We talked about true identity. Because the gospel, we talk about the gospel in Romans, it tells us that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, right? Amen. To the Jew first and also the Greek. And it's for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. What I've learned from Dr. Savell uh, as it pertains to this, he, t- he teaches what the key of victory is. And he says the key of vic- righteousness is the key to victory. It's the key to victory. If you, you don't truly understand righteousness, it, you'll be limited in your life. And so often in our lives, we're limited. And what I dealt with last week is sin consciousness. Some of the things I shared about sin consciousness is that sin consciousness is when you relate more to sin instead of God's righteousness. Sin consciousness is when you relate more to your failure than God's victory. Sin consciousness is when you relate more to your weaknesses instead of God's strength. E.W. Kenyon says that sin consciousness is the reason for every spiritual failure. And these are some of the things that I, I, I wrote down based on what the Holy Spirit spoke to me that I've seen in my own life is sin consciousness will destroy your passion for God. It will take away your vision and purpose for life. It will give you an inferiority complex. It will bring a sense of unworthiness that destroys your faith and confidence. Sin consciousness will rob you of peace of mind. Also, sin consciousness will make your prayers life, prayer life ineffective. If anything we need to be established in is righteousness. Amen. Righteousness We need to be established in who we are as believers in the world in which we live because if you're not established in righteousness, you will be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You'll be tossed to and fro by things that are happening in the world, things that are happening in politics, things that are happening in our school system, things happening all around us if we're not established in who we are in Jesus. You and I need to be examples and a picture of someone that's immovable. And the only way to be immovable is to be established in righteousness. Therein, back to Hebrews, I mean Romans 1 again, it says, therein the righteousness of God is revealed and it tells us that the just shall live by faith. The just live by faith. So as people that have been declared righteous, we live by faith. Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 10.38, uh, 10, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by his faith. So this is how we are to live. So as people that have been declared righteous, we are to live by faith. And it's in that life of faith that we find ourselves immovable. But if you don't truly know who you are, you'll be moved. Amen. We'll be moved. Yes, sir. The church will not fulfill its divine assignment. So today's title I'm not making this title to be political by any stretch of the imagination, but the title for today. And this title might get flagged. We'll see. (laughs) But the title for today is, What Do You Identify As? What do you identify as? (laughs) Some of you are like, oh, Lord. (laughs) Let's all take a deep breath. (laughs) Our society is big on labels. 
we're big on labels. Everyone's big on labels. The problem with labels is labels will confine you. We break everything up into labels, really what labels are are divisions. We break up everything in with race. Just go fill out an application somewhere. They're going to want to know what race you are. Why? Why does it matter? I'm getting into college. Why don't I tell you what race I am? Yeah, the human race. Now, come on, don't throw stones at me, all right? Just getting started. It, it, um, it's in everything. I mean, it's in the church. Come on. I mean, we, we break everything up in, in uh, ages, generations. Why does it matter if someone's a millennial or a Gen Z or a Gen X or a baby boomer or everything else? What is the, wh- why? I'm telling you, there's no victory that's going to come to the church because we really labeled someone a generational ideology. Our world is, is, is fixed on labeling things. What gender are you? And then they'll get into debates. It's like, well, there's only two sexes, but there's many genders. Wow. I think New York Times said there's over 100 different genders now. Like, wow. (laughs) Like I said, don't throw stones. Because if you really think about it, we all put ourselves into different labels. We have divisions as in Baptists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Catholics. We have word of faith. And I I, I appreciate and I'm honored with my heritage. And I'm what we would classify a word of faith prosperity preacher. But if I hold that label up higher then my identity in Christ, I'll always hit a lid. And you'll hit a lid. We have to stop defining ourselves by labels and we have to stop taking the bait. Stop taking the bait of what's happening in the world based on labels and divisions because it will keep us in bondage and it will keep us in hate. I mean, as I, look at the, as I look at the word of God, I mean, there, the word is very simple as it pertains to humanity. Very simple. See, man likes to make it complicated. I had someone ask me uh, in, out in public one time and they asked me and I was out with the police talking to a young person and they asked me if I was cis, cis. I was like, what is that? I have no idea what that is. I still don't. I didn't go Google it. But I'm like, I, I just said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. I, I believe the word of God is final authority. And so we have all these divisions, but yet the word of God is very simple. When Jesus talked about, when Paul talked about a society, he said, he, he says that, that we were all born different nations, all, all one blood, different nations, different nationality. We were born on the face of the earth that we might seek after God. But yet we try to put so many different labels on things, but yet Jesus made it simple. He's, he really boiled it down to a couple things. He said, sheeps and goats. And he said, and there's light and dark. Yeah. Right. Come on. Yeah. 
Some of you just loving me right now. <laughs> Paul said this. He goes, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. I mean, instead of getting into the debate about divisions and labels, why don't you just say, hey, we're all one in Christ Jesus? We're all one in Christ Jesus. I guess we need to get to Matthew 5. So <laughs> let's look at Matthew 5, 20. Yes, sir. We are talking about righteousness. Matthew 5, 20 says, this is Jesus speaking. And he's talking to, this is the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to all sorts of people, all different backgrounds, right on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. He says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see, because in their time, you had several different groups of people. You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, and then you had the Jewish people. Well, the Jewish people didn't see themselves in the same class as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They saw themselves as less than and not good enough. Not only that, but all Jewish people saw themselves as better than all the Gentiles because, because they considered them as dogs. Why? Because their society, human nature is no different than it's been since the beginning of time. Ultimately, it comes down to Satan who wants to divide man from God. And then man, because they operate and have a sin nature, they then want to divide everything else. So anytime you get into date debates to bring greater division to things, just know who you're operating in. So we have to understand this, and I'm bringing this for a point because we have to understand because what Jesus was dealing with is the fact that the Jew, regular Jewish people listening to Jesus in this moment couldn't see themselves even to come close to the Pharisees. But yet Jesus has the audacity to say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa. What went through their minds when they heard that? What did they think when they heard that? Man, to be, because they, they were judging things like, well, they're, they're so good. They're so perfect. The way they dress, how they pray, where they go, how do they go to temple, what they bring to temple, all these different things they're trying to measure up. That was because if you read the first verses, it goes, it says this, you tithe mint and rue, meaning they tithe. They, I mean, they bring their offering, they bring their gifts. They do all these things that they're supposed to do that they would think that would make them righteous. But Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Can't see the kingdom of heaven. Wow. So Jesus is trying to give us a revelation is, is you and the Pharisees aren't going to be able to step into a greater level of righteousness by the works you do. Thank you, Lord. I mean, Jesus was big on this because that, there was a big separation in the Jewish culture at that time. 
and they look down on each other. Jesus would say things like this about the Pharisees. Because remember, this is about exceeding. So exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, meaning their righteousness is gonna have to become preeminent. Meaning they're gonna have to come up higher, meaning it, it means to excel in quantity and quality. It means to be superior. So that's what Jesus is saying, that your righteousness needs to exceed that of the Pharisees. Your righteousness needs to excel in quantity and quality. Man, but that can sound impossible. You may be sitting here this morning and try, and, and one of the things I said about sin consciousness is it will cause you to compare yourself on what you're not because of your past. What you can never do because of your skin color. What you could never do because how you grew up in your finances. The experience you've had, the, fail, the, 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 the mistakes that you've made. And all of a sudden those things end up shaping the identity that we have and we put ourselves in boxes. But yet Jesus said this about the Pharisees. He goes, he tells them, Joe, he, go, he tells them, he goes, you are like cups. And he tells them, you wash the outside of the cup, but inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgent. What does that mean? Jesus is telling them, hey, your cup is pretty. The cup that you lift up to do the Passover with is amazing. But the thing is, is the cup that you're producing as ministers of the gospel this cup that you're producing is not to pour into someone, but it's to take something from someone. He also tells them, he goes, you are like whitewashed sepulchers. You're like tombs. And he goes, but you're full of dead men's bones. Wow. Meaning you, you look great on the outside, but you have no, nothing to offer anyone. You have nothing to offer anyone. And so this is why Jesus is preaching to them and says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. Go to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 18. was de being deposited in us this morning as I, as I go. Right now, I'm just laying a foundation. I'm telling you, it is, it, it is for the days ahead. Yes, sir. Come on. Luke chapter 18. Now, this is all in reference to what Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. Luke 18, verse 9. It says, also he spoke a parable to some who trusted in themselves. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. Wow. So that means they were putting each other in different boxes based on something. And they trusted in themselves. Mm. Thank you, Father. Who trusted in themselves and they were righteous, that they were righteous and they despised other. Then he tells the story. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So here we got two different peoples. We're, we put labels on them. They're a tax collector and they're a Pharisee. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. Wow. I mean, but you know how much that happens in church all the time? I mean, think about it. You know, we, we're, we're praising the Lord. We brought our tithe and we all that, and, but yet we're looked down on the other person because we might know the sins we can see, but we don't know the sins of you we can't see. I mean, you may get on someone because they got pregnant out of wedlock because you can see maybe the mistakes they made, but we can't see the mistakes you made. So we, we have to understand that, that it's, it's easy when we start trusting in ourselves how we like to put people in labels because then it makes us feel better about ourselves. And I want to tell us the church is just as guilty as anyone else because the church 
still has a human nature. They need to, they need to not be conformed to, for lack of a better term. The Pharisees stood and prayed with themselves, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then it says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, Lord. If we place ourselves in certain distinctions that God didn't place us in, then we are in positions and places of pride. And you are trusting in yourself. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This one went down justified. Yeah. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Thank you, Father. Hmm. Verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Wow. What's your heart's desire? You know, it's interesting, he didn't, he said Israel, he just, he said, my heart is all of Israel. He didn't pick out one people group in Israel. All of Israel would be saved. For I bear them witness that they, now listen, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Now listen to this, this is key here. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to God. You see, what was the key of Luke chapter two that Jesus was saying, the man that humbled himself would be exalted. The tax collector humbled himself and said that he went down justified. Now, what I want to pull out here, it says, if you don't know your righteousness, if you're ignorant, if you're ignorant of your righteousness, you'll try to make your own righteousness. And that is what's happening in our world today. You know what's going on in our world today is people are trying to put themselves in labels so they can feel like they're okay. I put this myself in this label because it makes me feel good about myself because the bottom line they're doing that is not because of, because of the, the main reason is they're just ignorant about who they really are or who they have the ability to be. So when you are ignorant of your righteousness, you're ignorant of your righteousness, you're gonna try to, you're gonna try to blend in with someone else that looks okay or looks like you. Why? Because we all want acceptance. Every single one of us, we, we want to know, is, does God have a plan for my life? And does somebody love me? The, the two questions that all humanity has is, does God have a plan for my life? And does someone love me? And when you, when you don't know who you are as a believer, you don't know who you have the ability to be in the eyes of God, then what's going to happen is you're going to, you're going to create your own righteousness. And you're gonna to try to set up things and that's really what goes on in our society today. Whether you're dealing with abortion, whether you're doing uh, with uh, genders, whether you're doing with whatever the question is, it really comes down to is people are ignorant of who they've been created to be. Yes. 
if you're ignorant of God's righteousness, you'll try to create your own. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to God, to the righteous God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. All God wants the humanity to know is just submit to me. Just come to me. Christ fulfilled the law. Christ fulfilled. Christ fulfilled the law, meaning it's not about what you do. It's understanding what Jesus did. Amen. Let's go to First Peter. First Peter chapter three. Let's look at verse twelve. Thank you, Father. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. With meekness, that's in kindness, that's in love. Meaning, as believers, we're not being in a position where we condemn the world. But at the same time, we're not supposed to be conformed to the world and we're not supposed to accept the world. Because he says that, that you're going to be condemned for righteousness sake because there's going to be threats that are going to come because you don't fall into their label or you may not agree with their label. Verse 16, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it be the will of God to suffer for doing good than doing evil. Verse 18, now listen to this. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but and made alive in the spirit. Wow. Hallelujah. For Christ suffered once in the, for sins, the just for the unjust, that's the exchange, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Mm. Verse 19. But who also he went and he preached to the spirits in prison. When did he do that? When he went to hell. Jesus went to hell. Some people don't understand that. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an anti-type or the opposite which now saves us. Or it's the same type, but it's a symbol. Now that saves us. Baptism. So baptism is a symbol of something. And what is, it, what is it? Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, meaning when you get baptized, it's not about the water washing your flesh off. But the answer of a good conscience towards God, meaning the symbol of baptism is a good conscience towards God. The word good conscience here means peace. The word good there means peace. And it means good conscience. It means peace and rectitude. And that means, rectitude means righteous. So when we say a good conscience, so what should have happened when you got born again is it gave us the ability to have a righteous consciousness. 
But yet the enemy will want you to continue to operate and think in your flesh. Now let's keep reading. Hallelujah. But the answer of a good conscience to the, towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. Therefore, so it's a new chapter, but it's still saying something. Now let me read verse 18 of the previous chapter real quick. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now look at verse one of chapter four. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, you see, we have to connect those together because everything after verse 18 is a description of what took place. <clears throat> Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Arm yourself with the same consciousness. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Wow. Wow. We should no longer be living according to the lust of our flesh. Why do we put ourselves in labels? Because we want to be conformed to the flesh. We want acceptance in the flesh. We want acceptance of the world around us. But here he says, he goes, here, you're, you're no longer doing things based on the lust of your flesh, but what? The will of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. For he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent, <laughs> for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. I got to the point where I had to say enough. I, I, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's really what he's saying here. He goes, for, for we have spent enough of our lifetime trying to fit in everyone's labels. We, you know it's exhausting to try to please other people? You know it's exhausting to try to find acceptance in this group or that group or this, this ideology or that ideology? It's, 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 it's exhausting. It's exhausting to watch the news. It's exhausting to listen to what's happening in our society and how they, they constantly try to put one person against the other and try to shape this or shape that and this person giving that perspective and it's not all true. This person giving that ex and it's not true. Why? All to fit us into certain molds and certain shapes and, and make us angry about things that we really, it's exhausting. Because you and I, as children of God, were never meant to focus our attention on the kingdoms of this earth. Now, we have to stand up. We have to do righteousness. We have to live righteousness. We have, that's why in Peter it said that you're going to stand up for some things and you're going to get threats and things are going to say things about you. I'm not, this has nothing to do with putting your head in the sand and we just sit here in a corner and wait till Jesus comes back. That's not what I'm saying. The issue is, 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 is you will never stand up for anything if you don't know who you are. You will not stand for righteousness if you don't even know you're righteous. He goes, I'm, he, Peter goes, we've done enough trying to live <laughs> based on how the world lives. That's what, what the Gentiles represent. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. Now get this, when we walked in lewdness, lusts, and each of these have different definitions as well. I'm not gonna go into those and what lust here really means. Drunkenness, reveries, drinking parties, abominable idolatries, in regard to these, they think it's strange that we don't, not, we don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. Meaning the world has labeled you, labeled us, labeled the church because 
we may not do things that they do or respond the way they respond. The world thinks it's weird. You're one of those Christians. I am. But am I a Christian that knows who I am in God? Do I wear the label of Christian? Or am I, am I really the real deal? See, because Christian has to become more than a label I wear, but a person I am. They think it's strange that you don't run with them in the same way, speaking evil of you. They give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They will give an account. The world will give. That's why we need to have God conversations because the world will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's why we need to be evangelists everywhere we go. That's why we do the ping pong balls out front. Verse six, for this reason, the gospel was preached. This is the reason the gospel was preached to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Amplifies it says it this way, the gospel was preached for this reason, that we might live in the spirit like God does. So why was the gospel preached? So you could say you're going to heaven one day? The gospel was preached so you and I could live like God lives. And God is righteous. As I was thinking about this and thinking about my righteousness exceeding that of the Pharisees, I was thinking about the story in John chapter three when Jesus had a conversation with Nicodemus. And he has this conversation and and Nicodemus saying, he goes, look, I know, I know you're a teacher that's come from God, meaning there's something about you that no one else is like But what Nicodemus didn't know it was, it was the righteousness of God in manifestation in the earth. And he was saying, now I know you're a teacher that's sent from God. And and he said, because no one can do the things you do, the miracles you do, unless God is with him. You see, the world needs to recognize someone that's embodying the righteousness of God. And so Jesus starts talking to Nicodemus and he says, he goes, well, if you're, if you're not, don't become born again, you not, can't enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is like, what you talking about, Willis? What you talking about, Jesus? Yes, I was a kid in the 80s. And so he goes, he goes, He goes, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, (laughs) I would still be like, really? (laughs) Like that was gonna answer the question? Unless you're born of water and the spirit and Nicodemus like, well, does that mean I go back into the womb and we go back into my mom's womb and I'll get born again? And that's when Jesus says, unless a man is born of water and the spirit. Man, (laughs) honestly, when I first read that 30 years ago, I was like, what are you talking about, Jesus? <laughs> because I didn't realize he's talking about unless you have born, been born naturally, unless you've been born spiritually, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Water represents coming from a woman. And if you didn't know, men cannot have babies, okay? Ask me a question on what a woman is. I'll tell you happily. <laughs> stupid. I'm like, I'm like, I was like, who changed biology in 35 years since I went? I, I 
They're really making people mad now. <laughs> but you have to understand this because the, the, hear me. So he's talking and he's like, and Jesus says, unless you're born like the water in the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And, and he goes in and he tells them this. He goes, the spirit. He goes, no one knows where it comes from. We can't see where it comes from, but we can see the effects of it. Now, I always looked at that as the spirit. Talking about, yeah, when the spirit's moving, we can't see the spirit, but we can see the effects of what the spirit's doing. And that's true. But he said, so is everyone who's been born of the Spirit. So you might not be able to see my righteousness on the outside, but you haven't fully known me on the inside yet. Because God's working on Justin. God's working because I've been born of the Spirit. I've been born of the Spirit he goes in and he, he's talking these stories and, and he even says this. He goes, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? That's what, Jesus, that's what Jesus told Nicodemus. You're a teacher in Israel and you don't even know this. And he goes in and he gives them something he can relate to and he starts telling the story that happens in Numbers 21 when you have a society that I was separated from God and all of a sudden you had these serpents that came out that I believe represent humanity and these serpents come out and they're biting all the people in the community. Why? Because they're saying God can't do this. God's not who he said he is. God's all this and, and really turning their back on God and they start getting bit by all these fiery serpents. God tells Moses is saying, praise him, what, what should I do? So he says, put a serpent, a bronze serpent up on a pole and everyone that looks at it intently, everyone that looks at it will be healed. So Jesus knew Nicodemus understood that story. And so he goes, he goes it's just like Moses lifting, lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. Then it says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It says he sent him into the world to what? Not condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. And it tells us that, he goes, if you don't believe, it says you're condemned already. What does that mean? You haven't accepted your righteousness. Yeah. Come on. So after Jesus rose from the dead, it, it's God's not keeping righteousness from humanity at all. The question is, is receiving the sacrifice. Can you put up verse 36 of John chapter 3? the very last verse, it says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. King James says, he who hath, hath everlasting life. And the word hath here, I wrote this down. Thank you, Father. It means to hold in your hand, and the word uh, hath also means to possess intellectual and spiritual faculties or endowments. So when he's saying here, he who hath everlasting, he who possesses spiritual faculties, he who possesses these endowments has a son. That believers shall not see the son, it shall not see life. But if I have, I have the son, I have these spiritual endowments. So when I received Jesus, I received spiritual endowments. I received some spiritual faculties that I can't get in this natural world. And I received, what did I receive? This spiritual endowment, I received righteousness. And the righteousness, the righteousness I believe, and I'm still studying this out, I believe righteousness is the life of God. I believe Zoe life is righteousness. I'm still studying this out, but I believe what Zoe life is, is God's righteousness. Because that's what Adam and Eve were clothed with in the garden. 
righteousness and true holiness. Go to Romans 8. Just a couple more scriptures. You're so attentive. Are you receiving something? Romans 8. Now, this scripture that I'm about to read is the, the scripture the Lord gave me the end of, the beginning of February 2020. And to me, it's just as prevalent in all the things that unfolded after, after in 2020. We all know what we walked through in 2020 and everything that took place. And so this, this is the scripture that the Lord said before I knew anything was happening. This was the scripture that the Lord said, this is what you need to teach and preach about. Because this is key. Because it goes back to how we think in this natural world. Let's look at verse five. For those who live according to the flesh, and when we see that, I want you to think of earthly, natural labels. Because that's what our flesh is, right? Our flesh, our, with our age, race, demographics, gender, whatever you think, those things are put us in these things in the flesh. So here he says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So, I mean, I just talked about that if I have received Jesus, I've been born of the spirit. So where should my focus be? On the spirit. So if I'm confining myself to a label, I'm confining myself to an ideology, and I'm confining myself to this understanding that what happens is all I can do is focus on that. I can't, I can't ever get beyond that because if I focus on the flesh, if, I, if I'm gonna live in the flesh, then all I can do is focus on what the flesh can offer. But if I'm born of the Spirit, then what I'm doing, I'm focusing on the Spirit. So as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to stop finding our strength, information, and wisdom and direction from the world around us because it cannot feed us what we need. Amen. So if you're living out of your flesh, then all you can do is focus on the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse six, for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And this is what I, I, I always communicate to us as a church family, asking yourself, am I being carnally minded or am I being spiritually minded? Let me ask you, do I have life and peace right now? Because the Bible tells me, the Bible tells us here, to be carnally minded is death. Meaning, if I'm gonna focus just from things from a, from a flesh perspective, there's, there's no life in it. But if I'm spiritually minded, I have life and peace. So that's a thermostat that we can judge that, that, hey, hey, do I have life and peace? Then maybe you're not, maybe you're being carnally minded about this situation. And through 2020, 2021, man, there was so much carnal, carnal mindedness. says, why? Because the carnal mind is against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Wow. Verse nine, he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Wow. See, now this is speaking to you and I right now. If you're born again, you made Jesus the Lord of your life, you are no longer in the flesh unless you choose to be. unless you're feeding your flesh. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And now get this. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. See, this is dead. You're like, well, no, you're walking. No, you gotta understand there's something greater in me. But if I'm just judging myself according to natural standards, then I'm limited. But when I understand I'm a spiritual being. Yes. 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 And if Christ is in you, if Christ is in me, is Christ in you? Yes. 
then your body should be dead. <laughs> You're like, you know, I, there, there needs to be some spiritual funerals all over this place because you need to crucify your flesh. We need, we need to crucify our flesh. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit, but the spirit is life. The spirit, now get that, because the spirit is life. Why? Because of righteousness. I have the life of God in me because of righteousness. That's where, that's where I understand that what righteousness is, is the life of God in me. Hallelujah. Christ is in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Really, it comes down to, are you living out of your righteousness or are you living out of your sin consciousness? Because the labels that this world offers ultimately are trying to keep you in sin consciousness. Magnifying your label above magnifying who God is. But if the spirit of him, wow, but the spirit of him, but the spirit of him, but the spirit of him, get this, but the spirit, but if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. So just as, just as the Holy Ghost, um, Romans 6 says it was the glory of God that raised Jesus from the dead. Here it says the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit went into the earth. Now get this. The Holy Spirit went into the earth, but what? The Spirit is life. I mean, the Spirit is righteousness or the life is righteousness. Get that? And through the Spirit, which is life, which is righteousness, the Spirit went into hell, life went into hell, which righteousness went into hell, and what was wrong made it right. You see, the Spirit of God that came into you and made you born again made you right, which is the life of God. But if you spend more time with the flesh than you do life, then you will be led and follow sin consciousness. Now, I know this is deep this morning, but I'm believing the Holy Spirit's hitting us all where we need to receive it this morning. So ultimately, the spirit, which is life, which is righteousness, righteousness is a force, Brother Copeland says. And the righteousness of God went into the, to the depths of hell and raised Jesus out. And it says that same spirit, which is righteousness, is what quickens, quickens, quickens my mortal body. See, that's why we got to stop focusing on all these natural things, because you have so much more in you than you realize. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm a spiritual man. And my spiritual man leads my flesh man. But when you hang out with the flesh, then the spirit's sitting there, hey, you have all of heaven in you and you're just letting your flesh run all over you. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean that God's on the inside of you. It's just like, hey, the very thing that raised Jesus from the dead is sitting right here. But you'd rather hold on to your label than your righteousness. You'd rather, you'd rather identify with your label than who you are in God. Wow. I'm never going to apologize for more scriptures, so go to 2 Corinthians. We have an appetite for the word. And I, I, I don't, you know, every church has a different what I say, what they're called to do and what they're supposed to focus on. But I think if we're not careful, there's churches in the world today that have taken away people's appetite for the word. It's like if it's not within 20 minutes, hey, I'm out of here, you know. 
hey, you know, man, 30 minutes is really max, Pastor. Well, I mean, say that to Paul who preached all night long. Someone Ray fell out of the thing and, and died, and he went and raised from the dead, and he still preached till morning. So, I mean, you're like, well, good thing we don't have a balcony. Yeah. <laughs> But you're, just, you're hungry, right? Yes. You're hungry. I sent you. You're receiving. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's another scripture. <laughs> I mean, but when you let the word explain, oh, my goodness, the word is so awesome. Yes. Say, I have an appetite for the word. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm. Come on. <laughs> Verse 12. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, oh, 5. My wife has, he goes, oh, you didn't tell us what chapter. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5, verse 12. Hmm. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but we give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. Whoa. Huh. Who do you identify with? What do you identify with? Or what do you identify as? Because say, here, I'm, I'm commending you this because there's people you need to talk to, and it says they boast of their appearance, but not their heart. Meaning, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. You boast in your appearance, but not your heart. You boast about what you think you are. You boast about trusting in yourself. You boast about all the things you might do in the natural, but... God's more concerned with what's happening in your heart. Amen. Peter says this, I believe, he's more concerned with the hidden man of the heart. Church, he wants our hearts. But you know also wants your heart? The enemy. And if he's put you inside of a label, he's got your heart. Boasting about the appearance and not the heart. For if we are besides ourselves, it's for God. For if we are sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us. Now, you need to receive, because we need to receive this as it pertains to what I'm sharing today. This is not about us to look down on people that have put themselves in labels. This message is not about, because then we put ourselves back into just another label and trying to compare ourselves. And we're better than, we're no different than that Pharisee and the tax collector. So what I'm sharing with you is not to, not to put us in a superior level of someone. Because Paul says this, he goes, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge this. What do they judge? That if one died for all, say all, all. then all died. Say, then all died. Verse 15, and he died for all. Say that, and he died for all. And he died for all? What? That if one died for all, then all died. See, there's a lot of people in our society that, that haven't come into a revelation or a place of faith yet that they believe that they have the ability to be free. He died for all, even though they don't realize it yet. If one died, then all died, and he died for all. Why? That those who live should live no longer for themselves. And if the church can understand this, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. We were born again so that we could no longer live for ourselves. Mm. 
Therefore, from now on, we, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have been passed away and be all things become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to him and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So hear this, I'm running out of time. You and I are new creations. Old things have passed away and all things become new. And because of that, we've been given an assignment. We've been given an assignment. The ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespass to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What I want you to see about your righteousness and my righteousness is that he reconciled us to God. Say, I've been reconciled. reconciled. Let me say another way to look at that and how it translates in in the Greek is this. You've been restored to favor. You've been restored to favor. But it's not just you and I being restored to favor, but we've been given this ministry of reconciliation to carry a message that, hey, you didn't need to put yourself in that label. You don't need to stay in that label. You've been restored to favor. You've been restored to favor. Because then he says this in verse 20, he says, now then we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin. King James says this, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm made righteous. Not becoming righteous, I'm made righteous. He who knew no sin, Jesus took my sin. He's restored you and I to favor. I've been restored to favor. I've been restored to favor. I've been restored to favor in his kingdom. There's nothing he's keeping back from me. I I have everything I have need of in his kingdom. I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. And I will close with this, Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32. So what? What do I identify as? I'm righteous. I'm righteous. I'm righteous. You say, well, but you're also this and you're all, no, I'm righteous. Well, you're, you're this type of, or you're, I'm righteous. Well, you're this age and you're born in this generation. No, I'm righteous. And I've been restored to favor. People, when you get into arguments about all these different things, you say, hey, I'm the righteous of God. I've been restored to favor. And know this, you know what? You've been restored to favor. Come on. Amen. Isaiah 32, and this is why we need to understand righteousness, especially in the hour we're living in. Thank you, Father. Verse 14 says, because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be deserted. Meaning one time it was great, but it became deserted. The forts and towers will become lairs forever, a joy of wild donkeys and pasture of flocks until, meaning things will be broken down until something happens. Until what the spirit is poured out upon us from on high. And what the wilderness will become a fruitful field and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. Verse 16 then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain the fruitful field. Now, verse 17, the work of righteousness will be peace. You want peace? Yes. Sir. Righteousness. Come on the work of righteousness will be peace. Another word for peace there is stability. 
the work. What does, when you understand your righteousness and you understand who you are, you see, when you, when you, when you operate in sin consciousness, you're confused about who, you're confused about, man, I messed up. I failed. I'm this, I'm that. I will never do that. I can't do that. That's, that's no, there's no peace in that. But it says, the work of righteousness will be peace, stability. Then it says, and the effect of righteousness will be quietness and assurance forever. The effect of righteousness. So when we understand righteousness and who we are, what is the effect of that? Quietness and assurance, that's faith. When you know who you are, you become immovable. You and I have been restored to favor. Amen. Let this revelation of righteousness be the very thing that gives you stability in unstable times. Let righteousness and who you are in God, let it bring peace in a time when it's hard to find peace. And let, peace, let this righteousness be the very thing that gives you assurance in the midst of adversity. Because you are, and I am, the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you for what it produces in our lives. Thank you that you have made us righteous. Not because of anything that we've done. Because what Jesus did at the cross and what he did for each one of us. Thank you, Father, for a revelation of righteousness. That they are, that we are, just as we ought to be because of you. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your word. Hallelujah. We thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we are righteous. We are righteous. You have received us. You have accepted us. We are accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. Mm. You are restored to favor. Restored to favor. Just place your hand on the person on your left and your right, and I want you to, in a moment, pray over each each other. And you don't know, you may not know who you're standing next to. but we know that you're standing next to someone in whom God loves. And they may be here today and been defined by labels and they identify with all sorts of things, maybe addiction, maybe anger, failure, fear. Maybe they constantly replay the regret of the mistakes they've made or even replaying the regret of what someone else did. And they feel like they've been placed into a certain mold, into a certain label. And they've come to a place where they've identified more with defeats than they have victories. Yes, Lord. If you're here and, oh, I'm just taking my time with this today, but if you're here and you say, Pastor, I, yeah, it seems like all I do is focus on my defeats and I don't really focus on victories because I don't, can't remember a victory I've had or 
your defeats far outweigh the victories that you've had and you just feel defeated. It's not to embarrass anyone, but I wanna ask, if that's you, I want you to come forward. And I'll have you pray over each other in a moment. I'm just, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. I know some of you have heard this statement before, but I may, maybe some of you haven't. But for me, I constantly saw myself as a failure. Failure. There's no need to go in the list of where that failure where I did it, didn't, where I did fail. But the point is, I know this is a familiar statement, but it said, someone said this before, that failure is an event, not a person. And so if you're stuck in the midst of failures and situations, then for me, I just was still considering myself, looking at myself after my flesh and what I can do and not looking to him. Father, I thank you. Let's just stretch your hands towards. Oh, Lord, I don't know the road any of these have walked but I know the road I've walked and I know you're no respecter of persons. Let your peace Dylan Everidge, come here. Hallelujah. Mm. So Lord, I just want you to just hug this young man and just pray over him. Mm. Restored to favor. Jesus. Danny, just sing something out of your heart. Beyond the righteousness of God, we are the righteousness of God. He made us righteous. He made us righteous. Mm. We are the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God. He made us righteous. He made us righteous.
we declare today we are the righteousness of God we are the righteousness of God he made us righteous he made us righteous We are the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God. He made us righteous. 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 I'm a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. All things are new. Cause he made us righteous. We are the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God. He made us righteous. He made us righteous. person on your left and your right. <sighs> what does the strength of a church look like in a body? that's grounded and founded in righteousness. Mm. That we come to the house and we lay every label down. Because there's no difference in Jew or Gentile. No difference, bond or free, no difference in male or female, but we're one in Christ Jesus. Lord, in this atmosphere, Lord, we just, we declare over this house and this body, Lord, that no divisions, that we will hold no division higher than we hold the fact that we are all one in Christ Jesus. So who do we identify as? The righteous. Restored to favor. Restored to favor. Lord, I pray that as we leave and as we depart today, just, Lord, that your peace would be ever present 
and a parent on each one of us. And the message that we would carry would be the message as ambassadors, be reconciled to God, be restored to favor. In Jesus' name, amen. If you receive that today, give him a shout of praise.